going to get started now. This is one of our earliest starts. There are a couple more people coming in. But I'm Tim Christ, uh, president of the uh, Newark History Society, and I want to welcome all of you here tonight. I think most of you know, and probably have heard me say this uh, a couple dozen times, uh, uh, the Newark History Society is, uh, we're a group started about 11 or 12 years ago. We've sponsored over 40 programs now. We're an all-volunteer organization with uh, some uh, 160, going on 170 members, and a mailing list much uh, longer than that. And it really has been terrific, the amount of support that uh, we've gotten over the, uh, over the years. We're excited that we launched uh, the website for the Newark Archives Project, uh, which we initiated. Um, we launched that website a, a few weeks ago with a nice reception here. Uh, that's uh, a project that uh, we're working on with the support of Rutgers University with the goal of identifying original source materials related to the history of Newark. Uh, Gail Malmgreen is our uh, uh, the uh, director of that project, and Gail, how many uh, how many collections have you described so far? About yeah, about fourteen hundred uh, collections of materials related to Newark have been described so far, mostly based on materials here at the New Jersey Historical Society, at the uh, City Archives under Bob Morasco's care, um, at the Newark Public Library, the Newark Museum. Uh, Rutgers Newark spreading out to um, NJIT and UMDNJ and soon Seton Hall and we hope in a widening gyre. Um, our next program after tonight will be in September on the 23rd uh, with John Zinn um, uh, with a, uh, uh, a presentation about Newark during the Civil War. If you can't wait for that, there are flyers out in the back. Steve Tedamonte uh, uh, has drawn them to our attention that John is giving a uh, presentation on the 30th of May, uh, sponsored by the New Jersey Historical Society, which is different than the Newark History Society, but here in this room, and it, I, it, it looks fascinating. It's called The Portrait of a Civil War Marriage, and it's drawn on the letters of um, William Lloyd and his wife Mary, and it's the challenges of a young married couple during um, the, uh, the Civil War. There are flyers on the table in the, um, in the reception area afterwards if you're interested in that. I do want to thank Steve, who's standing in the back, for hosting us tonight. Uh, the New Jersey Historical Society has really been wonderfully generous uh, to us uh, over the years. I also want to thank uh, the city clerk, Bob Morasco, for arranging once again for the uh, videotaping of, of this program and for um, arranging for the subsequent broadcast of the videotape on, um, on Channel 78. That's really, and then we get DVDs and make sure that the library and, and uh, Natalie Borisovitz and, at uh, Rutgers Newark uh, get copies and then that way really capture what happens in these events. Um, so with that as prologue, I think we're ready to get started. Uh, we are so fortunate to have Walt Chambers on the executive committee of, um, of the uh, uh, Newark History Society, and every now and again we can talk him into uh, helping to organize one of these programs and, and uh, moderating it as he is uh, tonight. I'm going to let him describe his own role during the Carlin administration and introduce members of the Carlin family and the members of the uh, of tonight's panel. Walt Chambers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See, being with the uh, North History Society keeps me off the mean streets, so thank you. <laughs> uh, as you saw on the flyer for this program, uh, my name Walt Chambers and I uh, got my first real jo uh, job uh, in the first year of the Carlin administration. He didn't know me, I didn't know him. I'm a fresh kid out of college and the service it was recommended and uh, he approved my hiring and in fact swore me in. So you can tell that I owe a lot to uh, Mayor Leo P. Carlin. So thank you very much. That's, we won't talk about that. We have more important things to talk about, but that's my, Association, if you say, why is he there doing that? 
<laughs> my way of saying thank you, Leo. Uh, and thank you for uh, attending this program. Uh, you are here to uh, bear witness to and to participate in another North History program uh, that will focus on the mid 20th century and uh, the political scene in Newark over those years. A period that had a lasting impact on what Newark is today, 60 years later. As the program flyer uh, indicated, the focus is on Mayor Leo P. Carlin, the first mayor after Newark's charter change. And the years, uh, and, and those years, as you many of you know, were called the New Newark. The format for us uh, is much the same as any other Newark History program. There will be presentations by a panel and then opportunity uh, for audience participation. We can surely learn from each other. The, this program was planned and organized by uh, uh, Brendan, as we know him, Dan O'Flaherty. We would call him our coach, uh, our manager. So any complaints or compliments, <laughs> see Dan. <laughs> I certainly want to begin by acknowledging the presence of uh, a good number of members of the Carlin family and spread over se several generations. Uh, and I can begin with perhaps the leader of that family, a daughter, Peggy Carlin uh, Clark from Bayonne. So will the whole family and friends stand? We know at the end of this evening, you'll be proud to say that was my dad. Uh, that was my grandfather, my great grandfather. Let me uh, then introduce our panel. Uh, the uh, first and lead off speaker will be our distinguished leader, Brendan O'Flaherty, who is a uh, professor of economics at uh, Columbia University, a native, native Newarker, son of uh, distinguished labor leaders uh, in and around Newark. Dan has a childhood memory, he told us about, of being in Mayor Carlin's office uh, to view the 1958 St. Patrick's Day Parade. Uh, the only thing he remembers about that is he couldn't see much because everybody was so big. <laughs> Our second speaker will be uh, Tom Giblin. Uh, everybody knows Tom, New Jersey State Assemblyman, 34th District, business manager of Local uh, 68 of the International Union of uh, Operating Engineers, and certainly a close associate and friend to Leo Carlin and the family. Uh, and in fact, Tom delivered his eulogy in 1999. The third speaker will be uh, Zayman Zhang. While not a native Newarker, uh, you would certainly think so based on all of his uh, involvement. Uh, you saw listed on the flyer, the, uh, he's active in uh, the Newark, or trustee, uh, in the Newark uh, Preservation and Landmarks Committee involved with the Watership Project, and on and on and on. Uh, Zayman uh, earned a PhD in child development. However, tonight he's going to be talking on a subject that he knows so well, uh, urban renewal. But there's no connection between urban renewal and child <laughs> development. Bef there will be, hopefully, a fourth uh, speaker, and I'll present him uh, when, he, when he gets there. Uh, there, but let me, uh, let me say right from the beginning, uh, on the flyer you saw and uh, many of you expected to see Bernard McGloon, who was a uh, uh, deputy mayor uh, in the Carlin administration. Unfortunately, Bernie had a fall uh, and was injured and is still recuperating, so he sends uh, sincere regrets. In fact, Dan just spoke to him on the phone to tell him he's here in absentia and we are uh, uh, carrying on without him. But there is a pinch hitter, hopefully. Uh, so, but before we, we sort of get into the heart of our presentation, uh, and much of what is being talked about, and much of what happened in the 
tenure and administration of Leo Carlin came out of Newark's charter change. And what I want to do is trip very lightly over some of the highlights of the charter change or reform or whatever name you want to give it. For those of you in academics or to consider the Cliff's Notes or Charter Reform 101. Beginning in 1917, in fact from 1917 up to the uh, mid uh, uh, 50s, Newark lived with the uh, commission form of government. Five elected commissioners uh, who managed the various departments and functions of city operations. The five commissioners uh, elected a mayor from what some people call the Gang of Five. The, and so there are many critics, as you can expect over the years, about this form of government. Uh, it, it, it led to these commissioners be, being considered, or it was considered a feudal system by many, with each commissioner ruling over his, his own fiefdom. And it, it was in, included much inefficiency, uh, and sometimes corruption, well, where doesn't that happen? Uh, it was expensive, and all the ills that you do not expect in a city government or a government at any level. There were attempts over these years between 1917 era all the way up uh, to the 50s to back in 1940 and 1942. Uh, there were referendum to change the form of Nurse government to council manager form, but they were defeated. So now we come up to, to the period of May 1953. And at that time, uh, and Leo had, is now up for his second term uh, as a commissioner. And he, in that election, this is still under the old form now, uh, led 26 candidates who were all running for commissioner, and he came out number one. Uh, and uh, the others who, other four who were elected at that time, names I'm sure to uh, any Newarker over these years, uh, Meyer Ellenstein, John Keenan, Pierce R. Franklin, and Sal Bontempo. Uh, and then Leo, as the top vote getter, uh, was elected mayor uh, by the other four. Even during that period and his first term as a commissioner, he too, even though he was part of the system, because that was the form we had, was a strong advocate for change. Now we come up to October of 1953, and a Citizens Committee on Municipal Government was formed. It was a broad coalition of many, many uh, uh, organizations and institutions in Newark. And that group was led by C. Willard Heckel, who at that time was assistant dean of Rutgers Law School. And co-chair was attorney, attorney Alan Lowenstein. Through their efforts and a broad, broad, and very active and strong community uh, effort, it led to a referendum on the ballot of November 1953, a ballot for change to the mayor council form of government. And here again, Leo Carlin was very strong, even as a sitting commissioner, in support of this change. So in November of 1953, this referendum for change was passed by nearly a two to one margin. Out of that came the uh, uh, Charter uh, Change Commission, which had the task, the mission of nominating and supporting candidates for public office under this new form of government. In May 1954, there was a special election for mayor, and uh, there the city elected nine members of the council, five in the wards, uh, and four at large, and Leo Carlin was elected mayor by the entire city, by the entire electorate uh, at that time. There was no runoff because he won the clear majority of the votes. So then, 
on July 1, 1954, he was sworn in as mayor of Newark under the new government, and that's the scene you see there. So with that backdrop, uh, we are ready now to present our panelists who will dig deeper and deeper into the, into the subject. I want you to know and, for, and to remind them that they have a uh, strict time limit. This isn't a free fall. They know what that limit is, but I won't, uh, I won't tell you because you'll then keep watching, looking at your watches. But they will get a, a gentle warning when their time is near up or over. If in fact anybody goes uh, over, there is a trap door under this podium and they disappear down to the old Mars Canal. <laughs> okay, so we have Dan up first, uh, I should say Dr. Dan O'Flaherty, who will talk about the political scene in Newark uh, during the early 20th century, leading up to and through the charter change. Dan. Okay, um, what I want to talk about is a general overview of the budget and the census and what the 1950s looked like uh, from, an o from the point of view of today and also from the point of view of the early part of the 20th century. Miles, you want to go to the, okay. So this is, what, this is me, we'll go to the next slide, we'll skip the next slide. That's just what uh, Walter said. Okay, let's look at the 1950s. The general overview of the 1950s are that the city was incredibly financially sound. Uh, for the first time since it got rid of the ditzy form of government called the Commission, it was well organized. Uh, it was generally prosperous. I'll show you some numbers on that. There was an aggressive promotion of public health. That I think is extraordinarily different from today. Uh, the most important invention in, of the 20th century that Newark was responsible for was made during this time, the shipping container, but that's a different story. Um, it was the heyday of progressivism and public health movement. Now I'll show you some numbers and, and talk about that. Uh, and finally, it was the perfect government for the 1920s, which is <laughs> the unfortunate part of it. Let's go on to the, the next slide. Um, look at the census first, general overview of the population. Uh, 19 50, Newark is close to its peak population. There's a slight decrease uh, from 19 to uh, 1960, but that's basically low, smaller household size. Uh, the number of occupied household units, housing units actually increases. It's just people are getting a little bit smaller families. Um, okay, so it's also, next slide, uh, a time and the, the, the impoverishment story does not hold. You look at what happened in this period, uh, people actually had more resources. Uh, median age rose slightly. Real median income rose. Uh, people in Newark were wealthier. Uh, in median income in Newark rose during this period rather substantially. In fact, the median non-white household income in 1959 was higher than the total income in 1949. Um, adult educational attainment rises, a smarter group of people. Uh, 8.7 years was, was median educational attainment. In 1950, it rises to 9.0. These, a lot of this is being carried by, by the great changes in the U.S. population in, in 1950s. Okay, let's go one miles. Um, this is, uh, there was less white flight in this decade than the average in northern cities. Uh, my friend Leah Brostan has studied this extensively. Uh, she, found, she finds a causal impact of 2.3. Uh, each new black resident of a, a new, of a northern central city uh, causes a decrease on average of 2.3 white residents, but that doesn't happen in Newark. Uh, in Newark, it's 1.54, uh, 63,000 yeah, 63,000 blacks enter, 97,000 whites enter. Very different. Either Newark whites are more tolerant or there's something good going on in the city better than average uh, during this period. It's, it's very 
it's different from the rest of the world. Okay, so let's look at city government. Okay, first thing you, you know, uh, it's it's uh, this is a incredibly sound. Uh, the current balance is 18 on a good year. Um, controls in the 50 million range. That's about where entering the bond market. Major, major investment. Okay. Uh, uh, at first gasp, you might think it's kind of flabby. Okay, it's got 6,900 people working for the city in water, uh, as opposed to city functions as 2012. And 2012 is a, is a lean. Uh, then had 14 patrolmen for each sergeant. Now it has eight. Um, no, 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 that's that's too boring. Uh, with many more functions, um, four-fifths of what's being spent today. Police and fire are third and fourth. Police and fire together are not much bigger than health and welfare by itself. Uh, um, uh, in real terms, it's growing by 4% a year. It's after inflation growing 4% a year. That doesn't work in a stable city, and this is a state a triumph of public health. <coughs> terrible, terrible repeat. Progressive error, the triumph of public health ideals. In Newark instead is sort of marked as the hiatus between the loss of the airport and the loss of the hospital. Um, because, and they could do it at ridiculously low salaries, so did Carlin's government. Newark attracted people and businesses and could tax because
foreign investment was prohibited along with everything else. Um, and factories couldn't move to China and take and employ them in uh, because what was going on in China in Carlin's second term, it was the great leap forward when two million people were beaten to death and 20 million people died from starvation as the peasants built backyard steel furnaces instead of harvesting the crops. Um, the world is interconnected. Everything gets, works to, together. The 1950s are a package. Uh, you can't recreate the good without recreating the bad, and there was an awful lot of bad, and that's why I'm not nostalgic. But Leo Carlin is part of the good part of the 1950s. Uh, the slate on which he wrote was quickly erased, sort of like building the world's best sand ca castle in Ortley Beach in October 2012. Um, but he's worth remembering for what he wrote on the slate that was erased, and it's worth learning from. Thank you. Okay, well, our next up will be Tom Giblin. And we've asked Tom to speak to the labor movement in, the, in Newark in the 40s and 50s. And within that, then, to talk about uh, Leo Carlin, the labor leader, Leo Carlin, the labor mayor, and Leo Carlin, the family man, Tom Giblin. Leo Carlin uh, was born in uh, 1908, uh, and as was noted previously, died in 1999. Uh, and his wish uh, at the end of his life was to be uh, have a funeral mass uh, in the Ironbound section uh, at St. James from whence he came uh, so many years uh, before. Uh, Leo had a uh, career uh, not only as mayor of Newark, uh, but uh, served uh, in the New Jersey General Assembly uh, in the late 30s and then was appointed uh, by then Mayor uh, Vincent J. Murphy uh, to the Newark Board of Education uh, where he served as president uh, for a number of years. Uh, Leo tried to run for commissioner uh, in 1945 but was unsuccessful. Uh, he ran in 19. Uh, 49. Uh, interesting that his uh, mentor, uh, Vince Murphy, came in sixth uh, in that race uh, and lost his seat uh, on the Newark uh, Commission. Uh, he served, as we all know, as mayor one year under the Commission form of government and then eight years uh, as mayor under the Mayor Council form of government. Even though he lost in 1966, uh, he made an attempt to come back uh, in 1966, again, then Mayor uh, UJ Adnizio, and lost that election. At the later end of his life, uh, he was in the uh, County of Essex uh, at the Essex County Youth House, where he served as its business manager and uh, lived most of his retirement years uh, in Avon by the sea uh, in Monmouth County. Uh, Leo had an affiliation uh, with Local 478 uh, of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Uh, this pattern of people who are uh, labor union officers uh, being involved uh, in government uh, in the uh, 20th uh, century probably started primarily uh, with the late William J. Brennan uh, Sr., uh, who was a uh, commissioner and also a officer of Local 55 of the International Brotherhood of Firemen and Oilers. In fact, Dan's father was a member of that uh, organization, and then we all know the distinction that Brennan enjoyed uh, not only through his son, who later was a Supreme Court uh, justice, but in his own right, uh, Brennan did come out a uh, high vote getter, uh, but never really uh, sought the position uh, of mayor. Uh, I mentioned Vince Murphy's name. Uh, Vince Murphy uh, is kind of in the annals of labor history, not only in New York, but throughout the state. Uh, interesting, uh, he's probably one of the few mayors that I could think of that had an opportunity to run for governor of New Jersey. Seventy years this year, uh, in 1943, uh, Vincent J. Murphy, uh, as mayor of Newark, 
uh, ran for governor of the state. Uh, he lost the general election primarily because then uh, Frank Haig, the legendary political boss of Hudson County, didn't have a lot of confidence in Vincent Murphy that he would follow his instructions and might be too much of an independent type guy, uh, which he was right on target with uh, in terms of being the governor uh, of New Jersey. Uh, Murphy uh, came out of the Plumbers Local 24. Uh, he was elected the commissioner in 1937, uh, and he was also reelected in 41 through 49. And during that particular era, he served uh, as the uh, mayor of Newark. And of course, he later went on to become the president of the New Jersey uh, A for Val CIO uh, later in the 60s, up till he gave it up uh, in the early 70s. Uh, local 478 uh, was a very influential local uh, in Newark at that time. Newark was truly a union uh, city. Uh, there was many uh, craft unions with substantial membership. Uh, there was a bustling area as far as uh, factories are concerned and deliveries and a lot of commerce uh, in the city. And uh, you know, local 478, uh, many of their drivers uh, moved around the goods and delivered the services and things like that, and he came off a great uh, base uh, in terms of his bid to become uh, the mayor of Newark. Uh, in 1953, uh, when the Charter Commission uh, recommended the uh, change of form of government you know, to mayor council, uh, there was other, other cities in the country at that time, uh, Boston, Philadelphia, Hartford, places like that, that had adopted uh, this form of government. Uh, his fellow commissioners were very vociferous uh, against this change. You know, primarily, uh, you know, Sal Bontempo, uh, Meyer C. Ellenstein, he used to call him Doc because he was both a lawyer uh, and a dentist, uh, and of course, Pierce Franklin. They didn't want to hear about any change of government because I guess probably was interrupting their term. And then, believe it or not, each commissioner had their little fiefdom, uh, and this would be kind of uh, broken up if you concentrated the power into the uh, mayor's office. But uh, Carlin kind of bucked his colleagues at that time, uh, was able to convince the voters of Newark. And then the uh, Charter Study Commission, uh, which consisted of Alan B. Lowenstein as the chairman. Uh, my father, John Giblin, was on that commission. <coughs> uh, Jim Callahan was on that commission. Uh, Ruth, Lynn, Ruth Lynn, who was president of the League of Women Voters, and then uh, Ray Del Tufo, uh, who was later U.S. Uh, attorney for the state of New Jersey. And of course, uh, they were off uh, on July 1st, 1954. I just want to identify that other guy in the picture there. That's Harry Reichenstein. You know, in the city uh, of Newark, we haven't had that many uh, city clerks. I see Bob Morosco in the audience tonight, but Harry was appointed uh, in 1933 uh, to succeed uh, the late William J. Egan, who was the uh, city clerk and later, some years later, became the Essex County Democratic uh, chairman. But, you know, the labor movement uh, was very uh, important uh, during the years uh, of Carlin's tenure. Uh, with the uh, municipal council that was elected at that time, uh, there was a lot of pushing and shoving because uh, there was a minority report uh, issued in conjunction with the Charter Commission, uh, where they wanted to elect all of the members uh, at large. So that would have been nine members at large, but the majority of the commissioners felt it should be broken up, uh, five in the ward and uh, four at large. And one of the strong emphasis at that time is they carved out the central ward uh, because of the large influx of African Americans in terms of trying to make a seat available on the North Municipal Council for an African American, and that uh, first uh, African-American uh, councilman uh, was Irvine uh, Turner, and it really wasn't until 1966, 12 years later, that uh, was enabled to elect an African-American uh, at large uh, for council, and that person at that time was uh, But the uh, makeup uh, of the council, an interesting thing uh, for Newarkers, uh, the concentration of power in Newark municipal government was very much up in the Valesburg section of Newark. Leo Carlin lived on Richelieu uh, Place. Uh, John Brady lived on Poe Avenue. Jim Callahan lived on 
Sheldon Terrace, uh, Joe Gallagher uh, lived on uh, Avenger uh, Terrace, and then um, I'm trying to think there's one more Valesburg up there uh, in terms of the council. So, you know, definitely had a lot of sway with that. Uh, my sense, even though Leo never forgot his roots, uh, one thing, first of all, he did do, uh, he did put many union representatives in positions uh, of uh, authority uh, in the government of some of the autonomous agencies. Uh, his president of the Newark Board of Education at that time uh, was a labor person. Uh, that was Dr. Morris Fuchs, uh, who was affiliated with the Luggage Workers Union. One big difference uh, during that period of time, uh, and this is a name if you really know a little bit about the history of Newark, uh, why the Board of Education maybe ran so smooth during Carlin's tenure was that the legendary Arnold Hess was the secretary of the Newark Board of Education. You might say, secretary? How, what does that mean? Uh, in many, many ways, uh, Arnold Hess was a lot more powerful than the superintendent of schools. In other words, he really kept things together in terms of the budget, uh, with the personnel, uh, with trying to motivate people, uh, and really keep a strong reign fiscally uh, on the Newark uh, Board of Education. There are many people that I know uh, in different other authorities. Uh, I see is it Tom Kelly. Tom Kelly, uh, his father was, of course, on the Newark Public Library Board for many, many years. But there was another uh, friend of uh, my father's, Tom Daly, who was uh, involved with the labor movement. And ultimately, he and Gus Kelly kind of served back to back uh, in terms of rotating the presidency of the Newark uh, public library, but there's so many other uh, agencies uh, where uh, labor people uh, were uh, in place. But with that background, even though he came from the labor movement, uh, Leo Carlin enjoyed immense um, popularity or confidence from the business community. Uh, if you look at buildings along Broad Street uh, that might exist now, uh, because of his relationship with the Prudential at that time, uh, I think the CEO, his name was Carol Shanks, uh, he, they built that new complex uh, right on Broad Street, uh, and it happened during Leo Carlin's watch. You know, the Mutual Benefit Building at 520 Broad Street, uh, there was different folks involved with that, Ellis Wieser and people like that. That happened, part of this whole concept about the New Newark, you know, the Blue Cross Building uh, at uh, Broad Street uh, and Bridge Street uh, was built uh, during those Carlin years, but the business community, uh, you know, even though he was a labor guy, uh, he was able to bridge the gap uh, about the importance of spurring uh, economic uh, you know, development. You know, thinking back uh, on different uh, issues, you know, he wasn't afraid to, uh, you know, take some bold steps. And one of the boldest steps that he did take, uh, which was not without controversy, was taking a police director from New York. Uh, and people weren't used to things like that. Traditionally, many of the people who had uh, risen up the ranks and you know, became chief, uh, and of course, under this new form, there was a director, but he took a, a person out of the New York City Police Department. Uh, I think his first name was Joseph Weldon, uh, and he was the um, uh, director uh, of the police department because he knew how important that was in the uh, life of the city. And of course, his administrator for a number of years was a fellow named he was Mariano Ronaldo, or Rinaldi, uh, and many of these issues about you know strong fiscal uh, management and you know surpluses and you know trying to uh, be uh, progressive as far as you know, tax collection uh, really uh, took place in many ways. Uh, and uh, I've advocated uh, over the years, uh, Leo Carlin was as honest as his day is long. Uh, he didn't really perhaps get the recognition that he deserves in the city. Uh, I tried to push it several times with some people on the council, and I'm not saying it was something deliberate. Maybe they didn't appreciate or maybe have a sense of history about what he meant to the city of Newark. Uh, his administration uh, was, was scandal-free. Uh, I'm not saying that should be a litmus test for a, a, a mayor, uh, but what I say, you've got to look at things in comparison, uh, that he was able to really uh, government uh, you know, for uh, all of those years, uh, he did it in a highly uh, ethical uh, manner. Uh, 
and of course, what it was emerging uh, you know, during the, uh, his term, uh, you had Nizio, who was the congressman from the 11th Congressional District for uh, 14 years, uh, wanted to be governor. And the proverbial uh, wisdom was he thought to be governor of New Jersey, he had to go through the mayor's office uh, in Newark. And as we all know, he didn't make that uh, next step uh, and got bogged down, to say the least. But uh, Leo Carlin uh, loved the city of Newark. Uh, he uh, did a lot of positive things as far as the you know, community is concerned in terms of you know, how well run uh, many of those uh, facilities were. And uh, Dan mentioned about you know, health. I think his, his health officer or director, I think, was a fellow named Aaron Haskin, if my memory serves me right. You know, some of these names start coming back to you when you're a kid. But uh, all I can say is that uh, Newark uh, it was well served uh, by the tenure uh, of Mayor Leo P. Carlin. Uh, we have those of us who lived during that particular era, uh, knew that he was uh, about good government. Uh, he was proud of his labor roots, uh, but he was always putting things first as far as the Newark community is concerned. And I'm glad to give you my insight. Thank you. See, obviously, Tom is a walking history book. <laughs> to be noted that he gave us all of that uh, without one piece of paper in front of him and had all the correct names, too. All right, our next uh, uh, speaker would be Dr. Zaman Zhang, who will uh, talk about uh, urban renewal in the Carlin years, and that was a very important part of his legacy. You know, after Dan and the Tom, my only qualification to talk about, talk about Leo Carlin is uh, probably I have an um, Irish grandmother. <laughs> How, however, as we can see, as I understand, Leo G uh, Carlin is not a mayor for Irish people in New York, but a, a mayor for everybody in New York, which is the indication of a new New York. And he is most proud, proud about his scientific management in his term of the city administration. However, in my opinion, his most profound impact on the city, on the city we are living, is the, the legacy of urban renewal. Since urban renewal suffered such a bad name, and I have to use my 20 minutes to cover the history of 40 years, and I will bring people back to 1930s, where uh, which uh, Colin grow, grew up and uh, joined the politics. The Great Depression changed the New York, its industry, its commerce, its population growth, and its stand in the state and the, no, and the nation, and therefore changed its politics. You know, we come to the comparison of new New York, that's old New York in the 30s and the 40s. In 1929, the city's re retail sale counts $328 million, or more than one-third of the whole state trade. By 1931, it counts only $164 million. It's about a 50% decline. In 1927 alone, the city constructed over 5,000 residential units comparing with the 5,000 in the next 15 years. While over 600 factories closed between 1925 and 1920, 1933, the annual payroll dropped from $90 million to $40 million, and annual wage from 83, uh, 839 to 429. After long delayed seaport return from the federal government's uh, World War I effort, a small window for developing a post-manufacturing economic base was quickly closed by the, de the Depression. With the tremendous human suffering, the city embraced the 1937 Federal Housing Act, which provided loans and annual contributions for low-rent housing and the slum clearings. Commissioner Franklin initiated the city ordinance for Newark Housing Authority immediately after the federal legislation, actually in the same month when the federal government passed the legislation. 
in Mars. Then we can see in 1930s and until 1940s, the New York's housing, uh, resident, residential housing is in horrible condition and reflected uh, everything else in the, in, during that period of time in the city. Like everything else in the city, the early housing effort was full of nasty schemes of a political football. As Commissioner Murphy said, the five city commissioners immediately brought patronage into the public housing business. New York Evening News reported, just to show, quote, just to show the blood still run thicker than water, the New York Housing Authority already has ventured somewhat modestly into the field of strengthening the family tie, unquote. Harvey Convery, the son of the authority's first director, Neil Convery, worked for Fessler, a general contractor of two housing projects. So did Frank Maguire and Robert Letter, sons of two housing authority commissioners. Leo Duffy's son of a city commissioner and the commissioner Murphy's brother, Eloy, become authority's construction staff. The authority's lawyer was the brother of Commissioner Franklin's secretary. Those early meeting records are very funny to read. For instance, in an October 1940 meeting, while housing commissioner took turn to name pay the jobs, Commissioner Zhang Li, a plumber's union leader, yelled, wait a minute, I've got to get a job for someone, some, someone out of this. Commissioner Maguire said, what do you mean? You got more jobs than any, anyone in the place. Lee threatened, don't get personal with me about job. And they threatened to settle the case outside the meeting halls. <laughs> and, and the, uh, in early, in early 1942, bickering and the scheme were only stopped after U.S. Housing Authority summoned the housing commissioners to Washington, D.C. and fired all of them. And the, the six early housing projects, however, with the 2,736 2, apartments were quite successful, except for Bex Terrace. All projects were built at the city edge and uh, on vacant land without much residential relocation. Now, um, I have to mention another person who, is, uh, wor who worked very closely with, uh, with uh, um, Mayor Collin. Both Collin and Louis Danzig were born in 1908 to poor families in the Iron Bonds and uh, in the Lithuanian, respectively. Collins' extended family had over 20 children. After only one year in St. Benedict, he became a truck driver to support his family. He was elected union president at the age of 24 and later served one term of the state assembly. During his service in the state assembly, he passed many, many laws in support of union and women and the teachers. <coughs> And Danzig's family settled around Olympia Street in 1911. He attended New Jersey Law School, a poor people's law school. Following the progressive thinking of his time, he attended evening classes at NYU, the new school, and Columbia to study housing issues. In February 1942, Danzig became the housing pro project manager of the Hyatt Court with a salary of uh, about uh, $3,000. As soon as he got a job, he quit his private law practice. He said, I cannot justify my time with two jobs. Later, Hyatt and the Pentington Court's social program designed by Danzig became the, nation, the nation's model for its semi-cooperative living under the Tenant Association and for its weekly teen dance, dances, sports programs, and movie nights. Also in 1942, Colin, a high school dropout, became the president of the Board of Education. In 1943, the city hired Harlan Bartholomew to plan its next redevelopment stage after the war. 
How could the city rehabilitate its dilapidated school, hospitals, streets, infrastructure, and neighborhoods, while the port and airport with hundreds of patronage, patronage jobs waited for urgent improvement of about $45 million. So Bartholomew secretly approached Austin Tobin, the director of the Port Authority of New York, to suggest, to suggest a seaport airport takeover. Austin Tobin asked uh, um, Bartholomew to keep the secret at, for the time being. In his 1947 master plan, he laid out the city's urban renewal strategies which is the protection of good neighborhoods and the rehabilitation of blight areas and the clearance the re and the reconstruction of slums. Colin became the city commissioner in 1949 and Danzig the housing authority director in 1948. Danzig's integrity, intelligence, and knowledge transformed the troubled agency for its next great leap. Ahead of 1949 Housing Act, he prepared all the legal work to name himself as the director of the city redevelopment. Colin was the only commissioner who voted against Danzig. In the decade after 1947, now the picture is a little bit different from Dan's picture. However, I think it complements uh, Dan's uh, presentation. The city lost about 100,000 middle class whites and added about 100,000 southern blacks, mostly cramped in the worst living condition. Some drastic measures were need to be taken. And the 1954 charter revision secured the business, business community, community's commitment. We showed the picture, please. This is a mutual benefit life Tom mentioned. And next one, this is a um, Prudential. At the time, because Newark was uh, not in a good shape with a high debt, with a higher tax, with a lo lots of problem, these business, uh, large businesses were planning to, leaving, to leave Newark until um, Mayor Cotton secured power to be the mayor and uh, started the new Newark. Urban renewal seems to provide the only hope at the time. According to Danzig, the renewal's purpose was to convert badly used land and high, uh, to higher and better uses. Then the whole city benefited from new construction, more employment, more readables, and the elimination of slum and blight. Title I of Housing Act led the most renewal program in the nation. The local development authority with the eminent domain power purchased blight, blighted properties cleared the land and sold it back to, at a deep discount to, pro, to pri, private developer for new construction. The federal grant covered two thirds of the loss and the local government the remaining one third in cash or services. Danzig was one of the most active local participants who actually drafted some federal laws, particularly Title VII in 1949 Housing Act. The implementation, however, was deeply flawed with a tremendous amount of red tape. I tried to create a chart and how you use the federal money. And my wife said it's too complicated and too boring. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and Danzig joked that, that uh, uh, at the time, although he has intimate knowledge about all these regulations, he joked that the red tape made his hair thinner every day. The redevelopment of old First War illustrated Newark's renewal. Among 16 blighted locations, the First War was the only one attract, uh, only attractive site to private developers, located next to the central business district, away from black minority areas. With the support from all Italian-American po political and religious leaders, 24 acres were cleared in 1952, including 1,100 families and 99 business. Eight 11-story towers were com complete in 1956 for 1,556 1, low-income families. By then, the public housing requirement under the um, 
President Truman called the uh, housing lobbies pressure, changed the adopt a different uh, standard for using public housing. So the income requirement is more strict. Many Italian American residents could not come back, get back to the low, low rent housing, but out of the city. The major challenge, however, was the middle income po portion of the site. After spending seven million, there were no private taker due to a limited Federal Housing Administration's mortgage insurance. The city's entire urban renewal was in jeopardy. Maybe by then, Danzig started to drink heavily to ease his tremendous pressure. Even at the time, even Longy's Wellman offered 400,000 400, of his own money as a seed money to attract more private investment. Finally, after frantic effort over 1957 Christmas, Herbert Greenwald of, from Chicago signed the contract on the last day of the year. The 20th century most famous architect, Ms. Vandero, designed three modern buildings with a construction tag of $25 million. I'm writing a, an application to put these three, three buildings on the National uh, Register of uh, uh, Historical Places now. Being considered as the former Mayor Valeni's confidant, Danzig, however, worked effectively under five mayors. After 1954, he convinced Colin to accept his renewal planning authority. In ex exchange, he let the mayor take all the credits. I asked Danzig's son, Howard, if your father was still around after all housing projects demolished, and what would he feel happy about? Immediately, he said, all these colleges. As early as in 1950, Danzig knew that the private money would not flood in, even with the Title I help. He initiated discussion on a consolidated Rutgers campus, this, despite the deeply rooted uh, New, York, uh, New Brunswick urban bias. Development in NJIT, Seton Hall, Essex County College, UMD, all depends on the renewal money. Now this is Rutgers, uh, this is the f first one, it was the first law school, then this is the library on the back. And the now fail, uh, failing, uh, failing med medical system, including university and the St. Michael's hospitals, was also the urban renewal product. The Performing Arts cent Center was first planned in 1950s also Danzig and uh, Leo Collins' idea. So was the huge um, gateway center. And this is a model of a gateway center. That's uh, all their ideas. When we talk about urban renewal, we tend to think that there's only housing project for poor people. Actually, it's the infrastructure for New York today. And uh, all those high rises across from City Hall and on Mount Prospect Avenue are an essential part of today's middle class housing stock. They are all product of urban renewal. Towards the end of the colon years, yeah, and including this, and you may not know where is this place. In the next slide, we'll show you Starledger is also the, the, the result of uh, urban renewal. Towards the end of Colin years, Danzig turned to boost the new industries. The city put together 1,528 acres of meadowlands for an industry zone. Fortune magazine called, called it at the time, potentially the most valuable and un undeveloped real estate on earth. And, Miles should. and there's many ways to calculate the impact, the scope <coughs> of uh, an urban renewal. And you know, this is very small, but it, you can conclude that they, are, they involve millions, hundreds, and even billions of dollars. And you should, can you show them another one? And this is the urban renewal map, and you can see the renewal planning covered a large portion of Newark, and all these colored parts. And this is the unfulfilled industry zone. 
And at the time, they had a quite a few national conference in, in the military park in, 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 in to, for, for, for how to develop this. Then some very reputable developers from all over the country and they come to contribute their ideas under Leo Collins' leadership. <clears throat> and Colin and Danzig relate to each other only professionally, uh, but create the most effective urban renewal system in the nation. As Har Harold Kaplan observed, Danzig pr pressed the system towards its goal, while Colin kept the system from flying apart. Danzig was goal-oriented, Colin was more interested in smooth smoothing rough the feelings and ur urging disgruntled participants back to the bargaining table. In May 1969, Danzig took his last trip with uh, officials from 43 New Jersey municipalities to Washington, D.C. for the last time. And they are there to meet uh, HUD Secretary George Romney, and our Romney's father. A broken-hearted man, he lashed out against federal urban policy, particularly the biased mortgage insurance practice. He believed that uh, he would have arrested the city's decline given a better policy. He resigned in June. During his long and uh, stressful years, he took only one, one week vacation in Florida on his doctor's request. Dealing with millions of dollars, he had never been accused of corruption, living in his modest home at 330 Hobson Street. And the same thing for Mayor Collin. After losing 1962 election, Collin had no job, had no party support to, 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 make, to, have, to, have to make a living for his own family. Both Collin and Danzig belonged to a long extinct category of American public servant whom Columbia his, historian Ken Jackson honorably called public entrepreneurs. Thank you. Thank you, three-fourths of our panel. Thank you. Tom Banker, are you in the house? He is not. So I'm going to show you how flexible we can be uh, in as much as I never had to uh, uh, gong our uh, panelists for, hey, your time is near up. And uh, I appreciate that. But I, as you recall in our introduction, I said you are here uh, to attend, but also to participate. So now uh, you're going to have a chance to participate. Well, we had, uh, and uh, Coach Dan had enlisted Tom Banker uh, to share uh, some of his personal uh, memories of his connections with Leo Carlin during his years of retirement uh, down at the uh, Jersey Shore. Uh, inasmuch as he is not here and the title really was Personal Memories, I am sure there are a number of, of others of you here who can share personal memories uh, over your time and your connections with Leo Carlin. So we're going to open up the floor in what would have been the fourth panelist spot for that, and, uh, and then we'll open it up for open questions or comments from anybody on anything related to the subject. So who has some, yes? You said that you had been sworn in by Mayor Carlin? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. <laughs> to what? I worked for, uh, this is an outgrowth of the, all right. Uh, but I, they can hear me out there. <laughs> it's all right. I'll, Dan, Dan ordered me back here. Uh, uh, but uh, they uh, created, uh, when the charter change came, an, or, a, an agency called the Mayor's Commission on Group Relations. Its purpose was, and I'm sure this was the creation of uh, Dean Heckel because he became our first chairman and, and others uh, on that group that they felt the need for a city agency that would help community groups and others foster good intergroup relations among the groups in the city. Very small agency, there were only two of us on so-called staff, and that person was 
Dan Anthony, and I always called him my first and very good boss in the business. But I was came the second year as the assistant director. I have a picture of that, that swearing in, uh, and uh, but it was on uh, newspaper, it's too delicate to bring in, make copies of. All right, well, yes, yes, sir. Uh, Leo and uh, my mother. Why don't you stand in? Uh, Leo and my mother were uh, brother and sister. Uh, Leo was my uncle, and uh, Peggy, uh, uh, one of the, I guess I'll say a few words for the family. Well, uh, turn, well, they turn that. Can they come up here? Yeah, that might yeah. be better. If you have right. time for. We have time. Uh, if you have time for some personal Leo uh, stories, uh, as I say, my name is Joe Delaney. Uh, my mother, Alice, and Leo were brother and sister. But Peggy is, is my cousin, and uh, Leo was just uh, a dear, wonderful guy uh, with a wonderful Irish sense of humor. And uh, if it's all right, I'll share a couple if you, of if couple you go of short. Too long, I'll give you what I didn't have to give them. <laughs> <laughs> what, one of the stories came to mind, which which is uh, proof of what Tom Giblin said before about Leo being honest, and I think the family can attest that we never had any money when <laughs> Leo was there. But one time, I played golf with Leo, and I uh, brought a fellow who parents were good friends of his, and. He was just thrilled to be able to play golf with, with Leo. It was just the three of us. We played at Spring Meadow down at the shore. And we get halfway up to the golf course, and this fella tells me, I left my wallet home. I have to take an electric cart. I can't walk because my leg has, I have a problem with my leg. So now I don't have nearly as much money on me as I thought I did. You know, I had plenty of money to start with, but now I'm paying for his green fee and uh, the electric cart, which I wasn't counting on. So we get done, and Leo says, well, let's have a beer at the bar. And I said, you know, great idea. So the three of us sit at the bar, and we have a beer. And Leo says, anybody want a second beer? I have very little money. This fellow left his wallet home. So Leo says, I think I have some money. We were on the Ironbound boat ride a couple of weeks ago. And he goes out to his car. And he comes back with a manila envelope with coins in it. So here's the former mayor of Newark. Now the bartender says, would you like another beer? And the former mayor of Newark puts these quarters and dimes <laughs> out on the bar from his manila envelope. And he's saying, 25, 50, 75, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have another beer. <laughs> now that testifies to, I think, his, uh, to his honesty. Uh, there's a family story about Leo, which Peggy, Peggy may remember. Uh, not one really did it involve me, but I can tell you some of those. But uh, Leo's younger brother, Huey, had a very nice house in, uh, in Chatham, lived there for years. And there was a family occasion, either a first communion or a confirmation, and, and Leo came to visit. Leo, Leo came to the party. And as he's leaving, his brother, Yui's wife, Audrey, says, Leo, why don't you ever come to visit? We're here 17 years. This is the first time you came. And he says, I don't want to make a pest of myself. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the family, the family story of Leo. Uh, I remember when he lived in Avon, as Tom said, for many years. And uh, once in a while, we would take the kids to a day at the beach. And I would call him and say, Leo, we're thinking of coming down someday next week to enjoy the beach for a day and go out to dinner. So would you like to join us for dinner? And he'd say, sure, when are you, when are you going to come down? And I said, well, you, you pick the day. I said, I, I can be flexible for you. And he said, I'm retired. Come whenever you want. And I said, how about Wednesday? He said, I'm busy. <laughs> the one political last, last story. Uh, I enjoyed New Jersey government and politics, and obviously Leo was heavily involved in politics. So I said to myself, I'm going to ask him a serious question. So I was with him at Avon one day, and I said, do you think McGreevy can beat Whitman? And he looked at me, straight face. He said, if he gets enough votes. <laughs> I said, Leo, that's the last time I ever asked you a serious question about politics. But thank you for honoring him tonight, and he was a great man.
any questions or comments based on what you heard these uh, three fine panelists uh, talk about uh, that you can add to? I see a hand way back. difficult time uh, getting a part, being a participant, a lot being allowed to participate in the reform movement. In fact, uh, uh, even the initial drawing of the ward was so gerrymandered that it was clear that a black could not be elected in that ward. And it wasn't until some of the black leadership went to Washington to the Census Bureau and got more accurate figures and came back and protested, and they were able to withdraw the ward so that a black, in fact, could be elected. Uh, but the last point, Urban Turner was very much against the reform uh, for a lot of reasons that would be inappropriate. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, once the reform passed and there was an opportunity to have an African-American representative, he was right there, right up front, and became the first uh, member of the city council uh, under the reform movement. And re-elected many times after. Well, yes. I heard somebody. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, on a lighter note, many years ago, about 14 ladies, we had a club called the Sweethearts. And every year, we did be president because you know how ladies are. You know, be president too long to so talk about. But every year, I think it was every March, Mayor Carlin would come to our house and swear in the office. <laughs> every year he would come. And we would, would always say, get everything going because he has to go. But he stayed. He stayed all the time. And we had a very good time. So that's how I know him. I knew him as Mayor Carlin. <laughs> One more. Back here, yeah. uh, Go ahead, Stan. Also, on a lighter note, I'm a little curious. In our house, Mayor Carlin was doing GLP, but everybody's referring to him as Leo. Why GLP in our house and Leo in the old Tom, you, you, you got insight? Leo P, well, you know, there was talk. Uh, you might view this as a negative. Uh, they used to call him Lead Pipe Carlin. <laughs> 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 of course, 
discussing some of the things with the Teamsters Union, you had me a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I guess I was, I guess I was in grammar school. In fact, no, uh, I went to Sacred Heart along with a lot of the uh, Carlin children. Uh, but the debates they had when you had these ran against them uh, in 1962, uh, they kind of stacked the audience, and uh, Huey kind of roped the dope him into uh, this issue about the black hand. Uh, I don't know if people recall this uh, issue, and of course, you went on to a whole thing about he was in the Battle of the Falls, and you saying something to me about my heritage or about the contributions of Italian Americans to the war, to the to the city. And he was like insinuating about that uh, Anizio had some type of uh, you know people connected with the mob in support of his candidacy, and uh, that that was an interesting thing. And then of course the other thing too is I remember as a kid uh, there was a picture. Uh, of Leo in Florida, and I think Peggy probably remembers this. It was a tremendous snowstorm. I think it either was in February of 60 or February of 61. I can't remember what year it was, but they had a, somebody had a picture of the Newark Evening News, which was very influential, of Leo kind of at poolside. And of course, the iron band was under snow. <laughs> and that, 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 that was definitely lethal. I mean, that, that set the stage for the, the 62 election, but that's. A couple of things that come to mind. I'm sure I don't know if you remember that too. Yeah. Yeah, they had the picture of Leo's in some type of the cabana. We got we got eight feet of snow. <laughs> well, the same thing happened in New York City, so we weren't alone. Yeah. Remember Lindsay? Yeah. I just have to add one one point to what Tom just said. Uh, Adonisio had a fellow who's alluding to what Tom said about the snowstorm of Leo in Florida. His line was, Leo Carlin's idea of snow removal is June. <laughs> well, I want to uh, now and uh, certainly thank our panel for uh, uh, all that they brought us in terms of facts, memories, and of course all of you. There is no question uh, that, you know, we could stay here long enough and we'll there is a, a, a downside, I guess, to every time, every individual, every administration, and we could also get into that. Uh, but may, perhaps we didn't enough of that for many of you. Uh, but nevertheless, I hope that uh, all of us leave here with a better understanding of what uh, the charter change was about. Newark in the early to mid 20th century. I like to say that it has a him to make this historic. Uh, and that you can leave here saying that I know something more uh, than when I came in. And for those of you who would like to know even more and have an in-depth understanding about the charter reform uh, with names and people and some of the things that Bob mentioned and so on, I refer you to a piece that you can buy here tonight. Uh, and it's published by the New Jersey Historical Society, the, our hosts here tonight. And uh, it was a piece written by Stanley Winters, and I'm sure most people remember him. Uh, and, uh, and Steve has it on sale only for tonight. Normally it sells for $10. He's giving a 50% discount. You can buy this piece for $5. See Steve as you go in the... Uh, library uh, off to the left as you go out the door. But again, uh, thank you all for being here and being a part of talking about Leo Carlin.